Hi, welcome. This course is Introduction to Literature. I'm Dr. Daniel Larson. I'm your professor for this class. Before we get started, I think it's important we really address two big questions that hang over an introductory course like this. First, what even is literature? Second, why should I study it? So what is literature? We have kind of an intuitive response to this. I think most people you ask this question to would say, you know, books and stuff. Of course, this is a pretty imprecise definition. There are a lot of books out there that I think most of us would say don't quite count as literature. Where does literature start? Just any old book end? This gets even more complicated when we start thinking about very well-known pieces of literature that are not books. Short stories, plays, poems, comics. So maybe we add a few qualifiers to our simple definition, like fictional narratives or, or, or imaginative writing. That's all well and good, but even so, it, it leaves a lot out. What about true life stories or, or memoirs, histories, autobiographies? And hey, words like narrative and imagination are pretty squishy too. Can we really say that something like the Declaration of Independence or, or the Book of Genesis are unimaginative? That raises another question. For a long time, we've treated mythology as literature. The stories of ancient gods and heroes from all over the world have become, for some, something like an Ur literature, the archetypes that form the very basis of literature itself. But can we really collapse the deeply felt and lived religious beliefs of ancient people into that simple definition of imaginative fictional books? At the same time, can we really say the highly poetic, dramatic, imaginative, symbolic set of stories in the Bible are somehow not literature? You can see how complicated this gets, and we really haven't even scratched the surface yet. Here's maybe another way to look at it. Look, for a long time, people thought of literature as some kind of a, a monolith, a closed set of exceptional works that somehow transcend time and space to deliver a magical experience, an emotional or experiential je ne sais quoi of feeling or revelation. Look, I, I don't want to discount this. I've certainly had this experience while reading a book. You feel like the whole world just gets bigger, and the simple things you always loved about the world or the small truths that have kept you sane somehow get called into sharper relief, and it's like, it's like you can see them all again for the first time. It's great. But you know, that, that can't be the whole story. So maybe we add another piece to this. I mean, somebody has to have written that great work of art before I could get a hold of it. There's got to be a mind someplace behind the text after all. An earlier age would have called this person a man of genius. It's a little weird, kind of gross. Let's not get too caught up on the gender language here. How about we just call them the author? Now, it would be easy to think an author is somehow a, a different sort of creature than the rest of us. Like, like, maybe the author has a special sixth sense for seeing deeper into reality or some mystical connection to the Force or something. It's kind of silly when you think about it that way. And personally, I think this is one of the more problematic parts of the whole man of genius idea. It not only mystifies a very human process, writing, but it robs everyday, ordinary folks like you and me from taking part in that process. I'm not with that. But the bigger problem with this whole scheme is that it makes literature something of a black box. I mean, if the author, the person of genius who stands apart from the rest of humanity, makes the great work, that transcendent, truth-bearing rock from outer space, how would we ever know about it? There's got to be another term in this equation. See, a work of literature is supposed to be read. That means its very existence is predicated upon a reader. In fact, an entire reading audience, an intellectual community with values, worldviews, expectations of their own. The work of a work of art needs a place for its machinery to run, and that machinery is in the hearts and minds and lives of its readers. But wait now, those readers don't come out of nowhere either. They have some pre-existing experience of their own. They have expectations, assumptions about the way the world works, about joy and enjoyment. They have taste. And that taste is itself fashioned from a thick soup of cultural practices, material conditions, metaphysical assumptions, and countless rituals that make up everyday life. The readers are made in the context of a specific time and place. A culture. Culture really stands behind all of this. And you know, the author is made up of that same stuff. They are informed by their surroundings. They respond to the language made available to them at that time, in that place. 
and they address the real-world questions and concerns that their readers also obsess over. So, the author makes the work, the work speaks to the reader, and both the reader's tastes and the author's raw materials are produced by culture. Okay, but here's the best part. The readers aren't just drones of culture consuming their own regurgitated ideas. The culture itself, you know, that, that collection of tastes and rituals, is the product of the readers. It's our expectations and rituals and tastes that underwrite the worldviews that hold sway in a culture. Culture conditions readers, but readers authorize culture. In all of this, then, the work of art, the author, aren't autonomous, free-floating, trans-historical angels. No, literary production becomes the fulcrum, the pivot point that cultural change hinges on. See, I really like this model. It explains a lot for us. For one thing, it tells us that literature isn't so much a closed collection of exceptional great works as much as it is a dynamic and fluid container for works that readers find meaningful. In a way, then, literature is less a platonic library for the gods to trip over and more of an approach to understanding the ways meaning gets made. This also means that literature isn't just an echo of the ideologies embedded in a culture. No, it means that literature gets to take part in challenging and shaping the ideas of a culture and invites readers to reimagine the worlds that have made us, us. Literature isn't the epiphenomenon of history. It's the very engine that drives history itself. Okay, just a quick footnote here. This all applies to contemporary literature as well. In some cases, we might substitute history with place or nationality or even subject position. But history as a concept applies to the contemporary world too. Okay, wait a second. Is literature just history then? I don't want those objections. Sure, it's a real question. If literature is a term that describes the meaning making in a specific context, then what we're really doing when we study literature is just analyzing that context. I mean, whatever we gain from this model, we seem to lose something too. Something essential about why we read literature at all. Can literature tell us something true about ourselves, about our lived experience? Something really true, like really actually really true. Not just historically dependent ideas or their immediately adjacent revolutions, but like true things that are true at any time period, any place. I guess this model's right, I have to admit that Literature contains no timeless truths. But wait a second, I think there's more to this, and, and that might be the answer to the second great big question. Not just, what is literature, but why should I study it? Well, now, think about it. In the model we just put together, the meaning of a literary text isn't just something discreetly woven into the writing like some kind of secret code. It's a poem, not a crossword puzzle. No, the meaning in literature is a collaboration between the text and the readers. Here's what I mean. Readers catch hold of a phrase or a term or a character, and then they find that reflected in their own experiences of real life. This is really the only thing we can mean when we say we understand something. Now, a skilled author can direct readers toward the most reasonable application of their work, but the author isn't the sole judge of the text. In fact, to borrow from 20th century philosopher and theorist Walter Benjamin, there's a meaning in the text the author is not yet aware of. There's a meaning that's waiting for us to read it. Now, don't get me wrong. We can't just say a piece of literature means whatever we want it to. We need to have good evidence from the text to inform our interpretation. Remember, it's a collaboration. But what it does mean is that we might have different perspectives on what the text means. We might recognize different ideas and highlight different pieces based on our own viewpoints and experiences. Because... Here's a real piece to studying literature. Literature is the search for truth, not fact. It's fact you want Dr. Jones' archaeology classes right down the hall. No, we can dream of lost cities and exotic travel because we follow maps to buried treasure. And for us, X always marks the spot. So what does all this mean then? Well, for one thing, it means that the reading audience anticipated by the author isn't an exclusive group. It's open to anyone who reads a text. When we read that piece of literature in our own time, in our own place, we might well find new things that come to life in ways that those original readers never saw. When we engage in literature in this way, we start to take on the role of a literary critic. Now, I want to be clear. When I say critic, I don't mean cynic. Cynicism prejudges things, expects the worst possible outcomes. It's the kind of pessimism for aesthetic taste that expects everything to be dull and empty. Criticism, on the other hand, actively engages a text 
It assumes the text has something to tell us. It's, it's creative, optimistic, adventurous. A critic is a critical thinker, someone who wants to figure things out. So we can start to swamp out some of our key terms here. Instead of an author, we have a critic. Instead of a literary text, we have an interpretation. Now the background piece to all of this culture gets a bit more refined too. Not just culture writ large, but the tradition of interpretations and illusions and political and sociological connections that inform that work of literature. As for the audience, well, that changes too. Now we're addressing our own culture, the expectations and questions and obsessions that plague us. This means that when we study literature, we aren't just uprooting a text from its place in the historical dialectic, but we are, as responsible readers, looking for the best ways to redeploy the text in our own moments. We aren't just trying to decipher what the author really meant to say. Instead, we're applying the text as a way to make sense of human experience in our own day and age. So, yeah, literature may not offer us timeless truths, but it does give us timely truths. And that's really why we bother with literature at all. It tells us something, not only about the past, but about the present, and in an important way, about the future, too. Reading helps us reimagine the world we're coming out of and helps us realize the new world we're going into. It can remind us that other people, too, have wrestled with the same fears and anxieties that we do. And that we, too, might slay the dragon or, or suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. When we study literature, we are putting ourselves at that central pivot point between traditions of the past and the birth of the future. Now, this takes more than just identifying our own perspectives on a text. The study of literature asks us to consider our interpretations as one voice among many. Not the interpretation, but multiple interpretations, applications to a variety of cases and interests, united by a common inheritance, the text, and a common aim, understanding what life is. Because in the end, the truth is really what we're after. We've got to remember that truth is a bigger thing than any one person can handle, than any one time or place can make known to us. We only get glimpses, bits and pieces that flash and flicker as we breeze by, but never the whole picture, never all at once. Truth is prismatic, and depending on where we stand, we get a different breaking of the light. So too with our interpretations. We might think of this polyphony of ideas to be something like a constellation. Each perspective is a point of light in the night sky, a whole shining world of its own. When we see another, and another, and another, we can start to connect the pieces and get a glimpse of an even bigger picture. Or if you prefer a different metaphor, literary study is like weaving a great tapestry. We can pull one thread of that tapestry out and see the richness, the color, the variation in texture. But when the thread gets woven into the tapestry, a whole new image becomes possible. And really, that image too needs interpretation. And from it, a variety of interpretations become possible. In this way, the study of literature really becomes a study of ourselves. What ideas do we gravitate toward? What expectations do we want fulfilled? What answers do we find compelling? And what questions do we think important to ask? And who told us that question would be important? When we get this, we read carefully, we read actively, paying close attention to the text, but also to our own responses to the text. That's what it means to read like a critic. I think that covers the why study literature question, but there's one last piece to this that I've glossed over, and frankly, it might be the most important thing about literature altogether. Look, reading literature is fun. It's a very unacademic thing to say, but it's also something that the study of literature often takes for granted. In the world of endless social media feeds and an avalanche of mass media that bombards us every day, this might be the most important thing to see how literature can speak in this historical moment. Long before the first literature class, people gathered around stories, recited poems, and fell headfirst into the worlds of stories and heroes and quests. Reading gives us a chance to slow down, to close out the other distractions, and escape for a few hours. When we read, we move into something like a meditative flow state, where we stay active in our minds while our imaginations populate the shared dream of the text. Reading is supposed to be fun. Maybe even more than that, reading is about joy. When we say we enjoy a piece of literature, we mean that something in that text spoke to us in a new way. Maybe it gave us language for something that we always knew but never knew how to say. When we read literature, we can see a tiny piece of ourselves reflected, magnified to examine more closely but we're also given the chance to see the world through someone else's eyes, to swap places with them and learn to empathize with people we'll never be. 
Reading literature is training in what it means to be human. And when we read, we're not just getting knowledge about these things. The act of reading itself becomes a way of healing. Okay, enough talk. Go read a book.